Okay, I guess some people are still joining into the webinar, but I guess we can start already with the, with the sort of introduction. Uh, so welcome to the webinar on the protection of the environment uh, during conflict. Uh, my name is Emma Hakala and I'm a senior research fellow here at uh, FIA, the Finnish uh, Institute of International Affairs. And I'm also a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Helsinki at the Erik Strand Institute. Um, so today we will have a really interesting webinar on uh, the protection of the environment during conflict. And um, the main reason that we have organized this webinar is the fact that uh, there seems to be an international momentum at the moment which is partly caused by the sort of increasing recognition uh, of environmental damage during conflict and especially the long-term ramifications that it has uh, on sustainable development and the recovery of the uh, countries from conflicts. Uh, but then also there are these new um, frameworks in international law, uh, most significantly the um, draft principles uh, prepared by the International Law Commission and then the military guidelines uh, prepared by the uh, International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, so now there seems to be this moment that should be seized in order to um, address the, the problems of um, environmental damage during conflict. Uh, and we should really, uh, we have the chance now to, in a way, move from this, uh, these frameworks into implementation and into action. Uh, so we have a very good panel today, I think, of people who are very uniquely uh, placed to talk about this topic. Um, first, we have Maria Lehto from the United Nations International Law Commission. Then we have Vanessa Murphy, who is a legal advisor at the International Committee of the Red Cross. We have Jani Leino, uh, who is a legal advisor at the Finnish Red Cross. And then we have Doug Muir who is a research and policy director at, at the Conflict and Envi Environment Observatory. And I will uh, introduce the speakers in more detail before they, they speak. But uh, just to give you an idea, uh, and I'm really excited to uh, have this panel here today. Uh, as a kind of a side note, uh, one reason why we're also organizing this panel is that we have just today published a briefing paper with my colleague Freek van der Bet, um, who I, I guess you can see his uh, picture <laughs> or <laughs> his video. Uh, and actually, Maya just posted a link to the paper in the in the chat if you're interested. Um, but just to give you an idea of what it's about, it aims to provide a kind of a brief introduction into the topic of um, seeing environment as a victim of war and also to these uh, sort of emerging new frameworks of international law to address it and then also go to go into the uh, problems with the implementation of, of these frameworks uh, and it, it kind of uh, um, tries to uh, make sense of the possibilities of uh, implementing these frameworks and also monitoring their implementation. Uh, and also to let you know, uh, one of the co-organizers of the webinar is the project Toxic Crimes, uh, Legal Activism Against Wartime Environmental Destruction, uh, which is uh, affiliated at the Erik Kastran Institute of the University of Helsinki. And uh, it's also led by Freek van der Beet, and I'm also working on the on the project. Um, and it's an interdisciplinary research project that aims to uh, examine the practices and obstacles of monitoring um, environmental impact of conflict and then the international push to develop new international frameworks in relation to environmental destruction. OK, but I guess that's it for the introduction. So we will go into the panel. And as the first speaker, uh, we have Maria Lehto, who, as I said, is, has been the special rapporteur uh, on the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflicts uh, for the UN International Law Commission. 
Uh, and she also has a very uh, long and eminent career uh, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Finland. And she's also an adjunct professor of international law at the University of Helsinki. Um, so please, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Emma. And good morning to everyone. My thanks go also to the Institute and uh, to the Toxic Crimes Project for the kind invitation to this timely panel. Questions of the state of the environment, some of which are real existential questions, do have their rightful place in discussions of international security, as has been increasingly recognized in recent years. Peacetime activities cause the most part of environmental degradation and damage in the world. But it would be wrong not to pay attention to the environmental impact of armed conflicts, which is considerable. Arguments about the law of armed conflicts uh, having its own logic that overrides environmental considerations are still being here heard, but luckily much more much less frequently than before. They are increasingly giving room for a more persuasive and powerful discourse about the imperative need to prevent, minimize, and mitigate environmental harm in conflict-affected areas. As far as the normative developments are concerned, the ILC work and the ICRC guidelines on which the current workshop focuses have been accompanied recently by a number of more specific initiatives regarding the protection of water installations, assistance to victims, and the international criminalization of ecocide. The ILC draft principles on the protection of the, the environment in relation to armed conflicts, as well as the ICRC guidelines on, on the protection of the natural environment in armed conflicts are more com comprehensive, both in their own way. As we will have a separate presentation of the uh, ICRC guidelines by Vanessa Murphy, I will only say that the two projects share the same objective, but differ in scope and approach. In this regard, I find they are genuinely complementary and mutually supportive. Within the time allocated to me, I will try to give you an overview of the ILC work and then say a few words about the prospects for the implementation of the relevant obligations and recommendations. A distinctive feature of the ILC draft principles, as some of you may know, is that they do not only focus on situations of armed conflict, but seek to cover the entire conflict life cycle. Their purpose, in other words, is to enhance the protection of the environment before, during, and after armed conflicts. Preventive measures to be taken before an armed conflict include, for instance, the obligations of training and dissemination of IHL, as well as weapons review but also voluntary measures that states are encouraged to take to better protect the environment. One further measure is the designation of areas of major environmental importance as protected zones. Another asks states to take appropriate measures to protect the environment of indigenous peoples in relation to armed conflict. There are also provisions related to how the environmental footprint of peacetime military activities and peace operations could be re reduced. And it should be added that these draft principles build on the recent practice by states around the world and international organizations such as the UN, the NATO and the European Union. The draft principles applicable during armed conflicts recognize the inherently civilian nature of the environment, 
and reflect some of the existing treaty-based and customary rules and principles of international humanitarian law, which provide general or indirect protection to the environment. It is at the same time recognized that other rules of international law providing protection to the environment, such as international environmental law and international human rights law, remain relevant in armed conflicts. Human rights law and international environmental law play a particularly important role in situations of occupation. Complementing the law of occupation, which was mostly codified during the first part of the 20th century. The draft principles relative to situations of occupation spell out certain environmental obligations that the occupying power has towards the population of the occupied territory, the territorial state, and other states. The draft principles applicable during armed conflicts also reflect uh, the existing treaty law, which protects the natural environment from widespread long-term and severe damage. Most of the 28 draft principles, nevertheless, focus on environmental harm below that high threshold, including harm that is caused inadvertently or by negligence, harmful practices, or harm caused by other actors than the parties to a conflict. Behind this broad approach is the recognition that environmental damage in conflict results from a great number of factors that are not only related to the conduct of hostilities. I hope to give you an idea of what this means in practice by taking up an example. Altogether, five draft principles are relevant to the protection of natural resources from environmentally harmful or unsustainable exploitation, a common problem in current armed conflicts, most of which are non-international in nature. The relevant draft principles include the prohibition of pillage, which is an established customary rule applicable in international and non-international armed conflicts. In situations of occupation, the prohibition of pillage forms an absolute limit to the exploitation of the natural resources of an occupied territory by the occupying power or by private actors within the area under the occupying power's effective control. At the same time, the draft principles relative to occupation take into account more long-term environmental degradation linked to harmful occupation practices. One of them seeks to protect the natural resources of the occupied territory from excessive and unsustainable use. Two further draft principles on corporate due diligence and corporate liability are relevant in the context of illegal exploitation of natural resources in conflict-affected areas. Given the role that business enterprises may have in perpetuating conflict economies and causing environmental harm. These two draft principles address the legislative and other measures that states can take with the view to ensuring that corporations and their subsidiaries exercise due diligence and can be held liable when they cause harm to the environment. The last draft principle in this cluster addresses the inadvertent effects of conflict-induced human displacement. Population displacement is a typical consequence of the outbreak of an armed conflict and one that may give rise to significant human suffering as well as environmental damage. The latter mainly related to the use of natural resources for food and shelter. Quite a few of the draft principles build on and reflect established obligations based on widely ratified treaties or customary international law, 
which have been interpreted in an environmentally friendly way. Other draft principles are based on existing or emerging practice by states or international organizations. In that sense, I can say that the draft principles reflecting both international law and practice are intended to either clarify international law or to contribute to its further development. Regarding the next steps, I should point out that the IRC draft principles are still work in progress. While the Commission adopted the whole set of draft principles with commentaries on first reading in 2019, it also invited states, international organizations and other stakeholders to send in written comments. The Commission will finalize the draft principles and commentaries in its next session in 2022, in light of the comments received. This consultation period is part of the Commission's normal procedures and a culmination of many years of debates in the UN General Assembly, to which the Commission reports annually. In addition, consultations with relevant expert organizations, such as the UN Environmental Programme, the UNESCO, and the ICRC have been a constant feature of the Commission's work on this topic. All this serves to ensure that the final product is not detached from the reality on the ground. This is an important consideration for the effective implementation of the ILC principles. For their ability to provide guidance to these different actors, and help them in taking measures that enhance the protection of the environment in relation to conflicts. The expected outcome will be a set of principles and commentaries. The Commission will not propose to the UN General Assembly to take them as a basis for treaty negotiations. And it's therefore quite important that they find echo in the different constituencies. Regular feedback from states, and consultations with different stakeholders during the drafting process, as well as the current consultation period serve this purpose. The more relevant the draft principles are, the better the prospect of making a difference in practice. Outreach and awareness raising are also important. Obviously, the UN General Assembly's debates contribute to this, as far as states are concerned, but much will depend on the civil society. A number of interesting proposals have already be, been made regarding tailored measures to reach out to states and other stakeholders. And I very much look forward to what the other panelists may say on this issue. Thank you very much for your attention. Excellent. Thank you so much, Maria, for that. Um, great um, intervention which i think provides a really good sort of uh, basis <laughs> to to start this discussion from and also gave us some idea of of what the, the actual impacts but also then the ways to to somehow mitigate them uh, might be so thank you maria um i actually forgot to mention in the beginning that we will have a question and answer part uh, after all the all the panelists have had a chance to uh, say something uh, and you can ask questions in the in the chat um, it seems that my camera is not working for some reason at the moment but uh, okay anyway so yes please if you have any questions you can already uh, write them in the in the chat uh, but um, you can also then save them for later and I will then read them and, and uh, ask them from the panelists. But then let's go to the next speaker, uh, who is Vanessa Murphy uh, from the International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, and she has been a very uh, key person um, sort of preparing these uh, ICRC guidelines. Uh, she works on the the legal issues related to the protection of the environment uh, uh, among among other 
uh, issues as well at ICRC. So I'm really looking forward to hearing her, um, what, what she has to say about this topic. Uh, go ahead, Vanessa. Great, thank you very much, Emma, and thank you very much to the organizers for inviting the ICRC to be a part of the discussion today. Can I just confirm everybody can see the slides? Yes, they are Wonderful. visible. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so uh, I'll begin, I suppose, with um, saying that we're so pleased to be here. It's a, it's a great group um, of people to be discussing this issue with at this time. As I think Emma and Special Rapporteur Lito have um, emphasized, there is a growing sense of momentum. So it's an important discussion to be having now. So I'll begin with that. Uh, to what extent or why is action needed now more than ever to strengthen the protection of the environment in war? As, as Special Rapporteur Lito has said, we know that the environment can suffer in a number, different, number of different ways in armed conflict and they can be quite complex, the different types of effects. At the ICRC, we are particularly concerned in looking at the action of warring parties, so parties to armed conflict, be they armed forces or armed groups. And so that's really the angle that we come at this um, from, with the acknowledgement that that is one part of a wider whole. And the ILC's draft principles certainly take that, that broader scope. Focusing to begin with then on really the action of warring parties, for decades at the ICRC we have seen that the environment is at times directly attacked, but also incidentally damaged by means and methods of warfare of different types. It is also impacted by damage to the built environment. What that means, quite simply put, is uh, degradation or pollution to water, soil and land. That can make drinking water and agricultural land more and more scarce and biodiversity can be irreparably damaged. So as you can see on the slide, um, research suggests that most major armed conflicts between 60 years recently have taken place in biodiversity hotspots. So that really accelerates the loss of nature that we're speaking about also in peacetime. And when the environment is damaged, conflict affected populations bear the cost. So really this is a protection of civilian issue at the same time. But why that has been the case for, for decades, we, we can all think of the Vietnam War, we can think of the Gulf War, these kind of moments in history where the discussion of the environment has come into the public discourse. But why the momentum now? I think there are a few different factors, but one of them um, for the ICIC certainly is the impact we're increasingly seeing of, of climate change. So increasingly in our operations, we see environmental degradation that is linked to conflict or not, also combine with climate risk. And what this does is it exacerbates the impact of environmental damage linked to conflict on dependent communities, because they depend on the environment for food, for water and livelihood, as we all do. So it is really these combined impacts of environmental degradation, climate risk, and conflict that have added new urgency to the ICRC's work in this area. The main message I think that I would like to, to sort of begin with and leave you with is while a certain amount of environmental damage may be inherent to conflicts, it cannot be unlimited and it is not unlimited. There are legal rules um, which quite clearly set these limits out. IHL, International Humanitarian Law, does not address all environmental impacts, but it does contain rules that um, seek to limit the type of damage that is caused to the environment in conflict. So the question then is, what can we do to ensure that these legal um, rules are better implemented and understood? So to step up our efforts to promote and enhance respect for the relevant IHL rules, Last year, we released our updated guidelines on the protection of the environment, um, on the protection of the natural environment in armed conflict. And these set out 32 rules and recommendations related to international humanitarian law and the environment. So very specifically, IHL, um, rather than the wider scope, um, a wider temporal scope and also legal scope that the IOC's important work takes. These updated guidelines, I say updated because the first iteration was released um, back in 1994 uh, following a request from the UN General Assembly. So what, what prompted the update or what is featured in the update? The 2020 version reflects developments in international law that have taken place since 1994, 
from areas such as weapons law to how rules governing the conduct of hostilities apply to the natural environment, bearing in mind its civilian character. So I think, I mean, in short, what the ICRC's updated guidelines are is a one-stop shop, all of the relevant international humanitarian law protecting the environment in one place. And the main purpose of having this all in one place is that we hope that the guidelines will be a reference tool for states parties to armed conflict and others who may be called upon to, to, to um, promote, implement or apply IHL um, as they do that. So basically a reference tool, a one-stop shop for relevant IHL. As special reporter, special reporter Alito has, um, has uh, so eloquently said, we, we at the ICRC see the guidelines as genuinely complementary to the ILC's important work. They're different in scope and approach with some overlap, particularly, for example, affirming the civilian character of the natural environment and the application of the conduct of hostility rules to the natural environment. So moving now to um, the content of the of, of IHL as applicable to the environment and in and more specifically on the IHL that is set out in the guidelines. In a nutshell, there's four different sections. Um, IHL uh, applies to the environment in, a, in, in numerous different ways, and we've divided this into four different categories, making up the 32 rules and recommendations. So the first type is what you'll see on your screen. So rules affording specific protection to the environment. And when we say specific, we mean the rules were adopted for that specific purpose. They have the word natural environment in them rather than general rules that apply more generally to other civilian objects as well, but also protect the environment. And here, what I'll say is, you know, the specific rules that protect the natural environment are the ones when we speak about IHL and armed conflict and international law and the environment that everyone kind of discusses in first instance. So that is in particular the prohibition on the use of means and methods of warfare that are intended or may be expected to cause widespread long-term and severe damage to the natural environment. So that's a really high threshold, widespread long-term and severe. It's found in treaty law in Article 35 and 55 of Additional Protocol 1. And that's the rule everyone thinks of. Um, that is uh, quite an absolute threshold, meaning that um, regardless of military advantage, if the damage amounts to widespread long-term and severe, it is absolutely prohibited. In that way, it is quite strong. Um, I will also say that, you know, this often takes a lot of focus, but there are also very important rules within conduct of hostilities that will protect the environment below that high threshold. So I think part of what I think we need to move towards is also really spending a lot of time discussing those conduct of hostility rules, which are more general, but just as important. So moving um, then to these more general rules, uh, I'll begin by just kind of saying what I think is hopefully relatively obvious and understood, which is that it's generally recognized that the natural environment is by default civilian in character. So what that means is all the different parts of the natural environment are civilian objects unless parts of it become military objectives. So it's not to say they cannot become military objectives, but that by default the environment is civilian in character. And that's a powerful fact because the principle of distinction, precautions and proportionality, which is sort of the core IHL conduct of hostility rules that protect civilian objects, therefore apply to the natural environment. And so one of the things that the ICRC's updated guidelines does is try and provide some commentary as to how those rules can be applied to the environment, because it, can, it does require some further thought, given that the environment is all around us at all times and as militaries conduct their operations. I'll focus very quickly and briefly on the importance of the principle of proportionality. All of the conduct of hostility rules are important, but the principle of proportionality in particular is an IHL obligation that has a lot of potential, if correctly applied and well applied and understood to the environment, can bring powerful protection. So what this rule says is on the basis of its civilian character, any part of the natural environment that is not a military objective is also protected against incidental damage, so disproportionate damage. And the incidental damage must not be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated from an attack against that military objective or another or and military objective in general. 
So that is to say disproportionate damage is, is prohibited. So in particularly important for the protection of the natural environment, in the ICRC's view, when assessing what that incidental civilian harm will be, both the direct and the indirect effects on the natural environment, as long as they are reasonably foreseeable, must be taken into account. So that's quite powerful because as we can, as we improve our understandings of the long-term effects of conflict on the environment or of military operations on the environment, that has implications for the proportionality assessment. That is part two, so two of the four sections of the IHL rules in the guidelines. The third is um, a section on rules governing specific weapons. Um, this, these are a few, but for example, the prohibition on using biological and chemical weapons can also indirectly protect the natural environment, as well as the rules, for example, to minimize the impact of explosive remnants of war. Fourth and finally, the last section of the guidelines then sets out rules um, related to the implementation and dissemination of IHL. So this is rules, for example, of military training, of dissemination to the civilian population, and just affirms that those general IHL rules also incorporate the natural environment. So emphasizing the fact that the natural environment should no longer be an afterthought as we think about issues such as the protection of civilians. Final, my final slide is to spend a moment thinking about how we put these rules, which can be quite protective if applied properly, really into practice. It is of course not enough that they exist on paper, um, and there is certainly plenty of work to do to ensure that they're better disseminated and implemented and enforced. So to support this, the ICRC has proposed four key recommendations to states, and the aim of this is ultimately to reduce the environmental impact of conflicts. So number one, we are asking states to disseminate the IHL rules protecting the natural environment and ensure if that, that if the rules are not already, then integrate them into armed forces doctrine, education, training, and disciplinary systems, as well as relevant international policy or legal frameworks. That's number one. Number two is to adopt measures to increase understandings of the effects of conflict on the natural environment, so as to minimize the impact of military operations when they take place. So for example, what that could look like is mapping areas of particular environmental importance or fragility beforehand. Um, that, that could include, for example, natural um, national parks or, good, or endangered species habitats, um, for example. Third, uh, identify and designate areas of particular environmental importance or fragility, such as national parks and endangered species habitats as demilitarized zones. That recommendation certainly requires perhaps the most thought and work, but nevertheless, we remain convinced as we have for, I think, a couple of decades, that this, the, the use of something such as a demilitarized zone um, or a protected zone um, as the ILC draft principles addresses is an important way that would provide a lot of clarity in particular of the kind that military commanders need when they are conducting military operations. So to have clear designations of zones where the environmental importance is clear. Fourth and finally, our, our simple recommendation and final recommendation is to exchange examples and good practices of measures that could be taken to comply with IHL obligations protecting the natural environment. So that could include, for example, conferences, military trainings and exercises exchanges. Um, that, I will leave it there um, with the um, observation that I think, you know, increasingly all of us are quite gripped by the climate and environment crisis and efforts to implement the legal protections afforded to the natural environment under IHL are really only one part of this, but nevertheless an important part. So ultimately, better respect for IHL could limit the impact that war can have on the natural environment. And now we have an opportunity to do important prevention work to, to um, encourage that those protections are put in place. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Thanks for providing such a comprehensive um, sort of overview of the instrument that the guidelines provide and also giving us some insights into what the implementation in, in practice can can be. So that was very interesting. Thank you.
All right, uh, we need to move to the next speaker. Uh, and he uh, now will move maybe uh, from the sort of more international level towards uh, more country level implementation and considerations. So we will hear from Jani Leino, who is uh, a legal advisor at the Finnish Red Cross. Uh, he has also been uh, working with these issues of uh, environment and conflict, uh, but he has also previously worked, for example, at the Erik Kastrian Institute uh, at the University of Helsinki. Uh, so please go ahead, Jani. Good morning to everyone. Uh, so yes, my name is Jani Leno. I'm the legal advisor for the Finnish Red Cross. Um, my job here uh, is to work in particular uh, uh, with the international humanitarian law, which uh, uh, is not only about the Red Cross, uh, but is specifically the law of armed conflict, the manner in which in international law, uh, in international law seeks to, to um, damage and suffering from um, uh, from armed conflict, um, and so I sort of take the the work on the international level very much that uh, Vanessa does and the rest of the ICSC, um, and we work on the domestic level uh, in order to spread knowledge about IHL. Uh, we train, uh, we offer expert advice and support uh, to the authorities uh, on a number of issues. We've done doing this for um, several decades, and we do it close cooperation with the public authorities, uh, ministries in particular, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and Maria has for, for years and decades been an important part of that. We, we gain support uh, for that. Um, so today, my intention is to a little bit reflect on, uh, so to say, what needs to be done, um, uh, this issue of environmental protection. Uh, is something that's obviously it, it, it has arisen as a result of uh, things that have happened in the context of armed conflicts or as a result of them. Uh, and they pose uh, international challenges which are being addressed um, in a number of ways. Um, one through the rules of IHL, uh, that then uh, the ICSC in this instance, for example, on this issue in particular, the guidelines serve as an important sort of, this is how you apply them uh, with regards to this issue. Now, uh, for me as a legal advisor at the Finnish Red Cross, it is then sort of for me to try to take it onwards from there. Uh, and what we look at is uh, to ensure that uh, the subject matter that we're looking at, that there's real implementation or integration, as we often use in the Red Cross Red Crescent movement. Uh, with regards to the international law and decisions related to, to armed conflicts. Um, the idea is to work on prevention and contingency measures to make sure that things don't go wrong, uh, rather than dealing with the problems that arise. Uh, very much I work with the general issues that are lawyers, in particular lawyers dealing with international law face, and that's how to ensure that the law or international law or international decisions have a real impact on the work of the public authorities and are reflected in that, be that funding, contingency plans, military exercises, etc. Um, a key thing, an element of that is, let's say, for domestic context, is is uh, what may be the shortfallings. Is there a problem that needs to be addressed? What is the impact that we want to desire? We 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 seek to to achieve. Um, from my perspective, if we look at this issue, for example, uh, one of the key uh, issues will be to see uh, in the coming years uh, to what extent the work of Maria and, for example, the the rules um, and uh, the, the the ICSC guidelines, to what extent are they reflected in strategies, doctrines, trainings, uh, in legislation also? Uh, because a part element, of, for example, Maria took up the issue of corporate liability. Uh, and this is the same issue faced, for example, with regards to the regulation of private military companies that work outside, but but also sometimes in, in, in certain countries about human rights abuses that the multinational corporation, corporations may be um, uh, causing abroad. 
uh, and this is a matter, this, this sort of the corporate liability and in particular the domestic regulation of corporations based in the country is, a, is, is one tool to, to uh, try to address this issue, uh, even though we may not be in conflict in Finland, but Finnish companies may be present uh, in particular in conflicts that, that relate to natural resources. And we know that's a, it's, it's a rising problem as it is. Uh, I think on a domestic level, when we look at this, I think very important thing is to look at to what extent there is a need for new law and to what extent there is a need for, let's say, better implementation or policies or a, a good culture. Uh, and I, th I think that in particular, this is an area where, in fact, a lot can be done uh, without requiring very much uh, uh, SS and, and the key element of that is is connecting the dots. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in, in a, in a minute. Um, uh, as I said, for us as the Finnish Red Cross, the key is to make sure that there are effective next steps. Finland has made commitments with regards to international Maria, uh, we would expect uh, uh, obligate or naturally from that will follow that the Finnish government takes upon this issue uh, to take concrete steps on a domestic level. Uh, this is something that Finland has been active together with a number of the Nordic countries the, the years. Um, uh, but uh, this is an area, I think, uh, in the manner in which to do effective work, I believe, is, is, is simply uh, it's a little bit in the spirit of the 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 um, uh, previous 2019 conference that we had, the Red Cross Red Crescent conference, about we, where a, a sort of better implementation uh, was the theme of one of the resolutions approved. Uh, the idea is to yes, we can do the minimum, but we can do better, and we can learn from each other, and and uh, that is key. When it comes to this issue, uh, it is. Uh, truly important to follow up, uh, let's say, that on a national level, persons doing cybersecurity doctrines or strategies or a commander compiling contingency plans for military operations, uh, uh, that their work, uh, let's say, these issues are reflected in their work. Um, and, and we try to do that in, in many ways also to try to, for example, try to bring experts together and maintain a dialogue, be that between lawyers and non-lawyers on a domestic level or whether it's bringing ICSC experts uh, or other experts from other countries uh, to, to, to share good practices, for example. Um, and I think this is an area where also if we look at this is an issue where, for example, NGOs and, and others um, can do a lot uh, because of their flexibility to complement the work of, of public authorities to ensure that they their expertise and their up to date on on this issue. Um, uh, it could be to bring uh, other uh, experts from other countries uh, which have already implemented certain obligations with regards to the, the protection of the environment. Uh, but as I said, it's also about those, for example, who are environmental impact experts in Finland, be that from the Ministry of Defense uh, or Ministry of Interior, uh, uh, sorry, Ministry of Environment, um, that to show uh, and to guide the work uh, with regards to how we could best uh, make sure that if Finland is involved in an armed conflict or there's an armed conflict that, that Finland faces, uh, that we are ready uh, to do the utmost to protect the environment in those uh, issues. For us as the national society, um, belonging to, a, let's say, a global movement, uh, this is a key thing. Uh, I, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of the, the support that I get from my uh, colleagues from other countries that I, you know, we organized a seminar together with the Danish Red Cross, and we had the Norwegian Red Cross, and uh, the British Red Cross, and the Swiss Red Cross, together with the ICST, provide us with experts from the militaries of all these countries to provide expertise and share them. And this is an area where where I think uh, a key thing on a domestic level uh, needs to be done. Uh, luckily, let's say around this issue in Finland, we are uh, we're an open, transparent society. We have uh, organizations, and we, as the National Red Cross, we have the we have access to decision makers, uh, and they listen to us. Uh, a key element of this, of course, is is how important the law and legal obligations are taken. And it's also a cultural question, but it's something also that we 
in fact, also have embedded in our constitution about uh, the law must be respected, uh, which uh, also pushes public authorities. You can push into effective advocacy with regards to this. So, uh, and I think that for us also, and I, a key thing here is 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 that we work both with civilian and military uh, authorities. Uh, and as I said, connecting dots is is a key thing. Uh, the Ministry of, of Environment already knows a lot of the things that need to be taken into consideration in, in, in times of armed conflict. Uh, and it's, it's bringing that data together to the others. Um, and if we look at, uh, and, and for us, I think a key thing is also to, as I said, to bring the data both, be that, ICSC's field experiences from all the contemporary armed conflicts, or be that uh, the conclusions that could be made from UNEP reports on the impact of armed conflicts uh, on the environment of, of particular states to, to really identify where are the areas um, where, in, let's say, negative environmental impact has been the greatest, uh, where one could have had uh, taken certain steps to diminish those either in advance or or doing it's sort of learning from from let's say mistakes as well but also from from good experiences and i think that that's that's sort of the uh many many of the key things that that uh that needs to be done but they also provide us with a relatively easy we don't necessarily need to do new things um and then also the as i said er earlier is is to be able to have a real overall picture of where new law may be needed and where it's simply that we need to implement it better or or, or change uh, the culture uh and obviously a, a, a some kind of political will is is needed on this on a domestic level um but but from our perspective uh here are some thoughts on 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 the domestic domestic side um that that we look on when we we try to follow up on this issue and and assist uh, and try to make sure that in regards to the context of Finland, uh, the protection of the environment in in situations of armed conflict is as effective as possible. So thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Yanni. I think that gave us again a really uh, clear idea of of what it or what can be done at the domestic level. What are the possibilities and and obstacles also uh, to the issue and and I think it was also really nice and interesting that you uh, sort of emphasized the role of international uh, and collegial cooperation also on this this issue so thank you uh, and let's go to the final speaker then uh, who is Doug Weir uh, who is a re research and policy director at the conflict uh, and environment observatory um, and he has been working on this topic for quite some time. I think he's one of the leading leading experts in the world. And uh, recently, CIOBIS uh, has also uh, published, uh, well, several publications on uh, related to this topic, but also on the implementation of the new frameworks, especially the ILC guide, uh, principles. So uh, please go ahead, Doug, and um, we'll be looking forward to hearing your points of view. Thanks, Anna. And uh, yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, just bear with me while I do the technological thing. Do, do, do. OK, uh, can you see that OK? I presume so. Yeah. Um, Great stuff. So uh, yeah, I want to um, talk a little bit uh, about uh, the best ways of implementing the ILC's draft principles. Um, yeah, that'll become apparent as I proceed. Um, and this was kind of a civil society perspective. Um, so we're a, a UK charity. We um, specialize in monitoring environmental damage and conflicts, but also monitoring and engaging with the legal and policy processes which are developing and have developed uh, around this topic in the last few years. We also work on environmental mainstreaming in humanitarian disarmament. So for example, in mine action uh, with our colleagues at Norwegian People's Aid. So at the end of last year, we um, concluded a study uh, undertaken with the support of the Finnish Ministry for Foreign Affairs, uh, which was specifically looking at the feasibility of developing some kind of implementation vehicle um, to help promote the ILC PEREC principles. 
Well, we're doing it, we looked at the relative value of the parent principles as part of this wider legal landscape, how they could be used to influence the conduct of state and non-state actors, and also looking at the roles of states and civil society in helping to implement them. The service has been covered by others, but um, yeah, just to reiterate why we need to protect the environment in relation to armed conflicts. So obviously we're facing this triple crises of climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution. And I think one of the key things we always see in our work is the way that not only are how armed conflicts and insecurity contribute to these crises, um, but they also impede measures to address them. <clears throat> and this is the really significant impact that conflicts have on environmental governance. And this is something which can last for decades after the conflict. So this is a reverberating effect driven by uh, weak governance. Um, from what we see for our monitoring work, you know, there is significant scope to improve the environmental conduct of state and non-state actors in relation to armed conflicts. While we perhaps see less of the big ticket items uh, caused by states, like the 1991 Gulf War fires, we still see equivalent incidents from non-state armed groups. And there are still situations where state militaries are engaged in practices and conduct which can lead to serious environmental damage. We see that in most of the conflicts which we look at. So there is a huge room for improvement and an overwhelming need to improve conduct. Uh, and I think Vanessa and, and Maria have touched on you know, environmental protection and the protection of civilians are interlinked. We depend on the environment. Um, and in terms of this sort of wider momentum, which we've already discussed today, you know, we've seen that over the last few years in the UN Environment Assembly for its resolutions there, through the protection of civilians debate in the UN Security Council and the way the environment is now featuring in that. In the time that I've been working on this, which is a, a while, <laughs> um, yeah, you really notice the difference in attention that this issue is getting um, and it's long overdue attention, let's be fair. So the big question for us is, this PEREC implementation vehicle, but I want to look at why we need it. Um, as Maya alluded to at the end of her presentation, the PEREC process isn't going to end with a treaty. You know, we've worked with colleagues on the mine ban treaty or cluster munition convention or the recent treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, or you have an international instrument and that establishes and sets up the dialogue and the processes that encourage implementation. States go to their review conferences, they have to submit reports. We're not going to have that with the ILC draft principles um, and that's potentially yeah, problematic in terms of their future impact. Will they actually be used and utilised or will they just be of academic value being written about in legal journals? I think as Maria has touched on as well, the temporal and thematic scope of the principles makes them really valuable from a normative perspective because they cover the whole range of conflicts before, during and after an occupation and because they cover everything from human displacement to uh, corporate liability, they're incredibly valuable as a suite of tools. Um, and I think from our perspective as an advocacy organisation, um, this process has been really useful because it has created this dialogue and discourse between us and other stakeholders and states. And that's something which needs to continue. So it's a question of how can we integrate that as well into this process to make sure there's this ongoing dialogue and discourse about why the environment needs to be protected, how it's best protected and sharing best practice. So yeah, the RC process seven coming on for eight years, five reports, 28 draft principles, 50 plus states have provided their views. So it has this degree of legitimacy. Uh, obviously the ILC is UN organ, it's been discussed in the context of the Sixth Committee, so they seen have that legitimacy from states, even for those states who may not be that supportive of them. Wide range of stakeholders have been engaged in it, and it's already made this huge contribution as part of these other processes, the work of the ICRC, um, the work in the UN Environment Assembly and elsewhere, so it's part of this landscape. So the question for us was then, how can we track and encourage implementation of the principles? So when we looked at kind of parallel processes, you know, databases, tracking conduct are widely used to kind of monitor and encourage policy change. So you could look to the sustainable development goals. You could look at the ICRC's IHL databases like on customary IHL. There are other suites which look at environmental policy in peace time. You know, there's a lot out there. Um, as I mentioned before, we see the parrot landscape not just as the ILC draft principles, but also this wider suite of initiatives. So obviously the Red Cross guidelines, um, but yeah, recent principles on the protection of water infrastructure. 
and something which we'd worked on, uh, which is the principles of victim assistance for those affected by toxic remnants of war. So there are these and others out there, and it'd be brilliant to be able to try and bring all these things together to draw out the most useful components of all of these and make sure they're uh, properly reflected. Over the last few years, um, we've worked on reviews of UK and Canadian PARAC practice, and this is the first time I think any country's PARAC practice had been reviewed. And it was a very interesting process to look at what we can actually find out about conduct uh, so looking at the different sources we can look at um, from internal documents to actually monitoring the, their conduct in conflict. Um, but I think what it really showed was that there's this huge variation. This is obvious, really. You know, no states are equal. They're all different. They all have different roles from a foreign policy, policy perspective. They may be engaged in different ways in, in conflicts. And that was really stark, these differences between UK and Canada, for example, and it would be between most states that you look at. So there's this question of how can you compare the environmental conduct of one state against another when, for example, one state like Canada may not be involved in occupations at all. Another state like the UK might have a foreign policy which is predicated on the use of nuclear weapons. Can you compare like and like? Because comparing it is part of the discourse and the dialogue that you need to build up with stakeholders and with the public as well, because this is something which needs to be visible uh, to the wider international community. So we thought it would be very difficult to use the 28 draft principles in their original format um, as a direct sort of set of principles to compare states on. So we then came up with this question of, well, can we develop goals and indicators which are based on and informed by the principle and this wider PEREC landscape? And in so doing, look at those which provide the most protection to people in the environment. And it seems like quite a promising approach. So these indicators would be practical policy steps towards implementation uh, with an overarching goal. Obviously, an approach like this isn't without risks. Obviously, the prime one is perceived legitimacy. You know, states may have engaged with the ILC process in the context of the UN, but then they see some civil society organization complaining about their practice based on a set of indicators and goals that they thought up. So we would need from the outset to a, develop them using a panel of experts and bring in a range of stakeholders from military lawyers to experts like the ICRC to also environmental policy experts as well. And also engage with states from the outset uh, to ensure this was something which other states felt comfortable with dealing with. And this on the right is you know, a hypothetical example just to give you an idea of what they might look like. So you'd have an overarching goal. In this case, it would be focused on implementation of the legal framework, IHL and the wider legal framework under PEREC, which as Maya mentioned, includes environmental law and human rights law, and then also a number of steps. And so these are based on part four of the ICRC's guidelines as constructive, practical things which states can do to work towards implementation of this goal. So then we looked at kind of the operational considerations and what we need to think about. Um, I mentioned before that it's important that the public have access to this and researchers and scholars. It's not just something which states look at themselves. So having an online database showing states' performance on these indicators uh, would be useful. And we thought perhaps maybe 10 goals would be the maximum uh, manageable. Um, and again, these focusing really on those which provide the most protection for people in the environment. We look at annual or biennial reporting, and then also this really valuable tool of creating ongoing dialogue, two-way dialogue with states. Um, and this would be an interesting one to do. So when we've, because of the scope of the draft principles, when we've engaged with states, um, so for example, we spoke to one a couple of months ago, uh, and they were saying, well, you know, thank you for your report. We're going to have to send this round to five or six different sections of government to look at because the scope of the principles is so vast. So trying to identify a contact point, somebody responsible who's engaged with this process um, would be part of the project because at the moment it's going to spread across different uh, parts of ministries and different ministries. We would hope that states would see this as a useful tool to help improve their environmental performance. Ultimately, it's not just us complaining about their environmental performance. They need to engage with this and see value in it. From the outset, as I mentioned, we were trying to develop a state friends of Parrot group, and that would help promote the database and its objectives. But they would also work with others to lead on and then share best practice on implementation so they can share their experiences with others of how they have done this. And that's a really important part of this kind of dialogue we'd help to develop. And then in addition to the work around the database itself, 
we would also continue to use parallel implementation measures, and this is to develop the normative status of PEREC and the wider landscape. And so we already work in a, a number of different international fora promoting conflict in the environment, and that's something which should be ongoing because there are a lot of security defence processes and a lot of environmental processes which interconnect with conflict and environment issues. So, for example, we recently worked in the context of the IUCN World Congress, uh, looking at a motion on conflicts and biodiversity in the Human Rights Council on remnants of war. We regularly make statements in the General Assembly First Committee looking at weapons and the environment, and taking research on corporate conduct, so speaking to that business and human rights process, and then continue to work in the context of the UN Environment Assembly, most recently on nature and conflict. So we need to be promoting PARAC norms throughout all these different fora simultaneously, and it's part of this wider movement to raise the level of discussion around these issues. So to conclude, um, without a treaty or an implementation vehicle, we think it's unlikely that the principles will have their intended impact. Um, we think that goals and indicators informed by the parrot legal landscape and which prioritise environmental and civilian protection could and should be developed. And we think the goals could form the basis of a long-term implementation and engagement vehicle uh, for states and also for other stakeholders. I mean, Yanni mentioned some non-state actors like private military security contractors, also business enterprises. There are a range of other stakeholders who should be and need to be engaged, not least of which are non-state armed groups, um, and there needs to be more engagement with them on environmental standards. Um, and the aim of this would be to ensure that the momentum developed by the parrot process and this wider movement we're seeing across the board would not be lost in the process. So our current status of the project is having undertaken this study. We're now looking to reach out to uh, donors to help support uh, initial stages of the project. And our aim would be to try and get it up and running uh, at the time the principles are adopted uh, in autumn next year. And I shall leave it there and uh, very happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you so much, Doug, um, for providing a very, uh, I would say, to the point uh, presentation or uh, reflection of uh, what the implementation and its monitoring uh, especially would really require. I think this gave us really a lot of ideas for the uh, discussion which we can now actually move on to. So thank you very much for all the speakers in the panel. Uh, we actually have already one question in the chat, but I would encourage all the all the participants to um, ask further questions in the chat. But in fact, at, at this point, I would give the possibility for uh, another colleague, uh, Savras, who will be joining our project at the University of Helsinki uh, in June. Um, to maybe comment or or ask a question in in case Stavros has any any reflections that he would like to share and maybe you can also uh, introduce yourself uh, to the audience uh, if he is still with us. Can you hear me, Stavros? Yeah, sure. <laughs> you can maybe go ahead and and uh, give your your comment now, and then we can go back to the discussion. Yes. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Uh, no. All these were great presentations on this uh, very topical issue. Uh, all speakers uh, have detailed the fact, have outlined the fact that there are many initiatives uh, at play at this moment. Uh, I have one, let's say, more positive uh, comment in the second, more skeptical uh, one. Uh, so let me start uh, with a positive comment, perhaps a question to uh, some of the participants um, about implementation. Of course, uh, if I was really wondering uh, about their ideas, okay, CEOPS uh, submitted a concrete proposal about uh, this uh, implementation vehicle, uh, as CEOPS uh, prefers to call it. I was wondering uh, what what is the view actually of the other participants on uh, an experiment, on an endeavor. Uh, of this magnitude, of this uh, calibre, uh, if they can see alternatives to this one or perhaps uh, complementary uh, projects. Because in many uh, occasions right now we see that uh, civil society is uh, standing up, 
uh, also in relation to uh, human rights uh, monitoring and assessment. Uh, perhaps from one perspective, this could uh, symbolize, signify a failure on behalf of the international community. On the other hand, uh, perhaps uh, it can also be seen as the empowerment of civil society and perhaps a positive, uh, let's say, byproduct or even a feature of uh, our modern society. So I was really wondering to, to hear uh, their views uh, on this uh, proposed implementation project or in general uh, about how to, oper to operationalize these uh, various legal initiatives, I ICRC guidelines, uh, the ILC draft principles, uh, which, uh, which should be uh, finalized next summer. Uh, this is more like of a question. The negative, let's say, or more skeptical uh, idea um, is about the potential fragmentation uh, that they can see in these uh, initiatives in certain uh, occasions, uh, in the sense that in some parts uh, there might be some overlap of these different uh, initiatives and processes. And uh, this is uh, an omnipresent question uh, to me, uh, to be honest, and I would like to hear uh, the views uh, of this. Uh, of your prestigious uh, presenters about uh, this potential. If they see, if they can identify a risk of fragmentation or perhaps they can see it as secondary or perhaps they can even see this crisis, potential crisis uh, as an occasion, as a chance to strengthen certain international uh, mechanisms or uh, as uh, avenues for international, for enhanced, strengthened international cooperation. So just to sum it up, uh, the first question is about concrete implementation project and uh, specifically what CIOPS is, uh, is putting uh, to the table of discussion. And the second one is if they see uh, a, a risk of fragmentation, how could this be addressed? Many things. Great. Thank you, Stavros. Um, and thank you for the very good comments and, and, and questions. Uh, I think we can maybe proceed so that I will also ask the two questions that we now have in the chat and then we'll uh, go to the panelists and then we'll go back for some more questions if we still have time. So uh, in addition to Stavros's points about the role of the civil society and then the potential of fragmentation, there is also a question about um, how can environmental concerns be included into peace mediation processes, uh, if any of the panelists have an insight on this and would like to comment. Uh, and then also Irmeli Mustalahti asks uh, whether you have looked at the possibilities to connect your work to the UN 2050 resolution on youth peace and security. So let's move ahead with these uh, four questions and you can address any one of them that you uh, feel that you want to. And let's maybe move ahead in the same order that we had in the panel. So uh, please, Maria, can you, you can be the first. Thank you very, very much, Emma. And thank you for the for the questions. Uh, I would pick up uh, the one, uh, first of all, uh, concerning uh, peace mediation. Uh, the ILC draft principles actually have one provision regarding peace processes. And um, it's cast in, in, in general terms. It asks uh, parties to an armed conflict uh, as a part of the peace process or uh, including where appropriate in peace agreements, address matters related to the restoration and protection of the environment damaged by an armed conflict. And then uh, it's also asked that international organizations should uh, play a facilitating role in this regard. I think this is uh, as much as can be said about the issue. There are a, num a number of uh, peace agreements where environmental concerns have been addressed. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, encouraging parties to uh, take measures to restore the environment, perhaps identifying the responsible parties that should 
uh, take the lead in this regard. And then I think it's quite important to mention the international organizations that have real, really considerable expertise in the area to facilitate uh, the conclusion of uh, peace agreements that take in the environment into account. Um, should I also continue to answer what Stavros put forward? Sure, yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, regarding, uh, I, I think it's, it was a very interviewing point about the possible legal fragmentation. I mentioned that there are a number of, a number of specific uh, legal initiatives uh, that have been uh, issued recently on water installations, on uh, assistance to victims. There's this process concerning the criminalization of ecocide. We don't as yet know whether that will end up in amending uh, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, or maybe there will be a separate self-standing International Criminal Law Convention. And then we have the ICRC guidelines and the ILC draft principles, which actually stem from they have the same background. Uh, both uh, institutions were asked to look at the problems of the environment and armed conflicts uh, a little more than 10 years ago by, by a UNEP uh, conference and report. Uh, this, the work in the ICRC and in the ILC has proceeded in tandem, so to say, and uh, also through mutual consultations. Um, I do admit that this some may see a problem in, in the fact that this will not lead to a comprehensive convention on the Fifth Geneva Convention that has been uh, proposed sometimes or another uh, comprehensive convention addressing the different issues raising out of uh, environmental uh, impact of armed conflicts. But I'm not sure that is what we should uh, strive for. Uh, there's also an advantage as in having specific uh, initiatives that are specifically tailored to certain problems. And sometimes I think that the, the problems we face, they are too broad and complicated to be addressed in a single instrument. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Um, let's go next to Vanessa then. Um, thank you very much, uh, Emma, and thank you for the questions, uh, Stavros, as well as the questions in the chat. Um, I will speak um, first to the idea, to the question about generally um, strengthening implementation. Um, uh, the, you know, the INCRC's view is is the classic one, which is that, you know, any initiative that has the purpose of improving the implementation, and here I speak specifically of the IHL rules, um, is, is a positive, is a positive effort. The main challenge facing IHL generally and IHL in the environment specifically um, is a lack of, a lack of implementation and awareness, and therefore um, efforts to improve improve how these protections are understood and implemented in particular given that they you know the environment is one at the end of a very long list of other protection of civilians issues so ensuring that it is effectively mainstreamed um, that that kind of initiative is positive um, you know i think the devil is always in the detail but i think that's the kind of thing certainly that civil society is very good at working out um, i'll leave it there Second, on the question of uh, fragmentation, which Maya has already addressed, I will just re-emphasize what she said, which is that um, a couple of different points, which I very much um, agree with. The first of which is that there are a number of initiatives, and certainly the ILC and the ICRC's work have, have proceeded in tandem. They had the same origin. We have, Maya very kindly was a peer reviewer on the ICRC's environmental guidelines. The ICRC will be submitting comments on the ILC draft principles. We have we have had a wonderful cooperation with Maya. So certainly, um, if you know, it is important um, that that 
I think, to both of us that these are complementary initiatives. The second point is to, to underline what Maya said, which is that I'm not sure that we're at the point with the environment and international law that we have too much yet um, in terms of initiatives and awareness. I think we're still at the point where um, certainly the, the complexity of the issues is so great and the lack of awareness and the sort of fragmentation of perhaps process in different sort of multilateral fora rather than fragmentation of law as such is the issue. And therefore, I think it has been really, uh, it has been a pleasure to work, I think, in the last couple of years um, on this issue precisely because there, there is a, a groundswell. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, then let's move on to Yanni. Go ahead. Yes, I, I, I wanted to make uh, a comment is, is, and I think that uh, Maria uh, made, made the point and I think this is a uh, general, uh, both lawyers, but let's say also, et cetera, with regards to, for example, problems which relate to armed conflicts. Um, somehow there tends to be a premise that more law is needed, you know, as if there was a void. Uh, and I think that it, there needs to be an important analysis of the fact that uh, to what extent the problems that have arisen, let's say, in relation to our, uh, the protection of the environment and armed conflict are uh, really related to issues. Well, we don't, if we had law in place here, that would be the answer. Um, that would address the problem. Uh, if we look at the conflict in Syria, uh, you know, the violations that have occurred there, it's not a question that the law of armed conflict is, is not sufficient. It's simply that it's not being abided by the, the mechanisms to ensure compliance or the problem, uh, let's say, for, for international law, not necessarily the rule. Um, and obviously those mechanisms are a key element also for the protection of the environment. Uh, but again, I think that Maria is correct in, in pointing out the being your faith in, let's say, that the ILC would produce in, an international instrument that would then magically then address the issue, um, I think is misguided. I think there is a lot we can do otherwise. And I think, again, let's say from my perspective, again, as a domestic, I always, what, what has an impact? Uh, you know, a reference in section of the law on the armed forces that Finnish defense forces will abide by international obligations. Uh, yes, it's a legal obligation, but that doesn't uh, ensure anything. Um, uh, however, if you include it uh, as a key element of the training of, of, of uh, people who train uh, the use of weapons, you can have that impact. And the same thing goes for, for other areas, and uh, in particular in the environment where that's something that's actually been addressed, for example, with the the armed forces they have a strategy on the protection of the environment they do they do quite a lot um and this goes a little bit to this one of the questions that was here about the environmental concerns to what extent they need to be included in peace mediation process i think a key question to that is to what extent we have evidence that uh the inclusion of them uh would be uh, would have had an impact a significant impact on the problems um you know, there are a hundred areas where we can improve things and do things better, but let's say on an international level, you may need to decide to focus on one or two things, be that in the in the connection of a peace process or, or other processes. And I think that the in order to address the problem as to the, the best possible way, uh, you may need to make a decision about, okay, what are the areas where we really can have, whether it's a peace be aid and uh, law, or other things where by let's put a focus on this and that will have the most uh, positive effect um, and and it will have a sort of real life impact. I, I, I think that's the, the starting point for everything because, you know, on a, on a principal matter, of course, it should be in mediation processes, but, but the key question is, uh, has a lack of that led to environmental concerns uh, being not addressed? I think that, that that's, a, that's a key, key issue. Um, lawyers very easily also we tend to oh let's make more law, uh, but but we don't make law for law's purposes. We make it in order for it to have an impact and to, on on the behavior of states and individuals. And I think that that needs to be maintained and remembered all the time. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
Uh, all right, then let's go to Doug finally. Go ahead. Thanks, Emma. Um, yeah, I won't answer, speak to the one that uh, Stavros asked about the principles and the uh, implementation, which I also think is a fantastic idea. Um, but yeah, I mean, just briefly on, on peace processes. Um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot more scope to include the environment in them. So, for example, we have just done some work on groundwater use in Yemen. So Yemen is an extremely water stressed country and historically access to water has been a source of local conflicts. Um, what we found was that dramatic, there were dramatic declines in Yemen's groundwater and it seems inevitable that unless these kind of issues are taken into account in any future peace process at whatever stage that may come or local peace agreements between uh, given the state of fragmentation in the conflict then you're going to be storing up problems in future. Um, similarly if you look at issues like deforestation in post-conflict countries which is typically rampant, um, like Colombia is a very good example and the how these things play out isn't always straightforward so it's not just a case of a new government or administration increasing deforestation. In Colombia's case it was an issue of land rights which has obviously gone to the heart, been at the heart of the conflict um, historically um, and also the FARC group moving out of areas which were previously provided some protection for forests for and then there's a sharp increase in deforestation. And at the time of the peace agreement in Colombia, there was a lot of hope and a lot of optimism about the environment. You know, the uh, environment ministry, a huge presentation they had, which were flagging all these impacts from mercury contamination from artisanal gold mining to deforestation and other issues and how it was being fated as this kind of green peace agreement. And actually the reality of what you've seen is that the environmental issues haven't been implemented effectively uh, post peace agreement for a number of reasons. And because of that, we've seen this rapid increase in environmental issues. So it's not just a question of ensuring that the environment features in peace agreements, which they should, but it's also supporting governance in post conflict and recovering states to make sure that the environmental issues are not forgotten about, not neglected, and that there is the capacity to deal with these rapid societal shifts that you see in post-conflict countries, which often drive these environmental problems. Just on the second question around uh, how local people, NGOs and grassroots organisations in areas can be better engaged. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think historically there's been this sense that people living in conflict areas and affected by conflict have more things to worry about than the environment and that the environment is you know, just simply not a priority. But I think as the ICRC have argued and we argue that, you know, environmental quality is critical for health, for livelihoods, um, and people are genuinely concerned about these issues. And we see environmental organisations often flourishing in conflict affected areas. You know, for example, in Libya post 2011, there was this huge expansion of civil society but as part of that you had this huge expansion of environmental organizations as well despite what they've been having to live through at the time and so there's a key question of how you can engage with these organizations um wwf did some interesting work in capacity building for civil, new civil society organizations in libya um but then also the question of how can we and what's our responsibility to make sure we give them a platform so that they can speak and engage with these international processes and get their voices out there. And how can we help support capacity building, for example, through supporting them with uh, citizen science and monitoring techniques that they can use, which would also be super helpful to us because while we can do remote monitoring using satellites and other sort of open source intelligence and other sources of information, getting information from the ground on the environment in conflict areas is kind of the remaining key challenge and the part of squaring that circle of data. And it's only with that data and understanding that which we can then use to judge the implementation of these legal norms by states and other actors. I shall leave it there and I shall share a link to the uh, Yemen research. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Doug. Um, yeah, there is not much time left, but we have a very good question from Anne Palm uh, about how local people, NGOs and grassroots organizations uh, can be better engaged um, in this uh, planning and implementation or in the planning and implementation of these processes of protecting the environment. Uh, and then we also have uh, a request for a comment from uh, Anu, uh, Anu Saarela, so please if you can briefly um, 
ask your, your question, Anu. Thank you for a very uh, inspiring discussion and very varied and many different angles. And uh, thanks go to the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, which addresses a very um, topical issues where apparently there is a momentum right now. What I would like to flag is that Finland, together with the Finnish Red Cross, has pledged at the International Conference of the Red Cross and Red Crescent in 2019 to increase knowledge and awareness of IHL rules in this field. And I would just like to mention that um, we have excellent uh, cooperation here in Finland domestically in this field. Of course, Maria's work is great inspiration to us all. And uh, we have pledged to um, really put attention to the domestic dissemination of the ICRC guidelines. And um, as everybody understands, it's all, always easier, for instance, to integrate the guidelines into the training of our armed forces if, um, if it's uh, easily available in our domestic language. I wonder if my camera will also work. Finally, <laughs> okay, so uh, this I would like to just uh, share as, as a, maybe a good practice. And it will be interesting to hear from Vanessa. And thank you uh, for the very good cooperation uh, concerning the translation also with you. Do you know other such ex examples of good practices that we could uh, learn from? Thank you very much. Thank you, Anu. And uh, let's go then to Vanessa and then also if anyone from the panel would like to address the question about the engagement of local people, uh, we would be happy to hear. We only have a few minutes left though. <laughs> go ahead, Vanessa. Thank you. And thank you, Anna, Anu, very much for raising this example of good practice. It was that the Finnish and Finnish Red Cross pledge was very much welcomed by the ICRC at the time. So thank you very much for making this pledge. It's an ex exactly the kind of example that we are trying to encourage through the recommendations related to the guidelines. So thank you. Um, uh, in terms of other examples of good practice, there are there are a few. Another one, uh, the, um, the government of Burkina Faso also pledged at the 2019 conference in particular to look into um, um, demarking demilitarized zones. So to look into potentially mapping environmental areas of fragility in Burkina Faso. So that's one um, similar pledge that was made in 2019. In terms of other examples of good practice, there's a few, a few were highlighted in the guidelines. I would say that a very recent one is, for example, the recent NATO SHAPE manual, which specifically integrated the environment into the SHAPE manual. There's a, many other examples like that, where there are military manuals and policies which sing, single out the environment and not only repeat the widespread long-term severe rule, but more generally implement other rules protecting the environment. So, um, so there are other examples. Um, and, to provide another NATO example, because I as as relevant in this region, um, NATO has a few standard um, standard operating uh, procedures that go into a lot more detail on um, how to fit what kind of environmental zones to identify as particularly important. For example, um, yes, I'll, I'll leave it there as a few different examples. Thank you very much again. Um, I will also sneakily um, quickly speak to the previous question about the involvement of local organizations and flag that um, last week the ICRC together with the Federation and other humanitarian organizations launched the Climate and Environment Charter, which is now open for signature. It's open for signature by any humanitarian organization, including local NGOs. We received, um, we consulted with over 150 um, humanitarian organizations, both international and local, about the content of this climate and environment charter. And what the charter is, is a set of six, I believe six or is it seven, commitments um, for humanitarian organizations to skill up, to skill up how we are um, assessing and responding to the environment and climate crisis. And under that charter, uh, local NGOs can also make their own commitments. 
the context specific commitments as to their own context. And so I might just I'll share the link in the um, in in the chat just for further information. Thank you. Great, thank you, Vanessa. And then let's give the final comment to Maria Lehto. So go ahead, Maria. Thank you, Emma. Dak and Vanessa already spoke about uh, the involvement, engagement of uh, local populations and uh, NGOs. What I would like to add to this is about concerning uh, the current uh, ongoing uh, consultation period regarding the ILC draft principles. It's not unprecedented, but still quite unusual uh, in the ILC practice that when uh, the invitations were sent to states to submit written comments on the draft principles and commentaries, the same invitation was sent to international organizations, but also to other stakeholders, as I said, uh, including uh, civil society organizations. And I'm very happy to say that the joint uh, NGO submission by a number of expert organizations has already been uh, sent in to the ILC. Thank you. All right, great. Um, we could continue this discussion for, for quite some, some time, I'm sure. And I'm sure that uh, it will also continue in other contexts. Uh, but now I'm afraid we have to end uh, this webinar here. So I would like to really warmly thank all of our great panelists. And also thank you for all the links that you posted in the chat. Uh, I'm sure they will be really useful for our participants. Um, and thank you also for all, all the participants for, for being there and for asking great questions. Uh, but that's it for now. Uh, thank you very much.